Hi, yeah. Um, as promised, I'm back to answer some of the questions that you uh, you guys have been um, kind enough to send through to me. Uh, I'd like to apologise for the delay. Uh, I've actually been busy at work, which, uh, to be honest with you, I'm quite grateful for in these times, just because, yeah, I think I'll be going stir crazy, sat inside with the sun shining, not being able to do anything. So I really do feel for for many of you out there that have not been able to get onto the bank or go to work or or live live your lives how you normally do. So yeah. Um, right, let's have a look at some of the questions. Um, I'll just flick through each one, pick a few questions and answer them. Um, so the first one, Steve Lomas asks, um, when fishing the margins with a strong margin pole with puller top kits, what is the best elastic to use, a medium heavy or a bungee? Um, so when fishing short or in the margins, generally we're talking about catching big fish, um, even if it's F1s, this rule will still apply. Um, I like to use uh, quite a heavy elastic um, for the size of fish that I'm catching. So um, yeah, the basic principle is uh, what I want to be able to do is get the fish under control really quickly and stop that first initial run because big fish will run um, when you hook them at close quarters far more than what they would do when you're fishing further out. Um, and the name of the game is basically to get that fish under control. Uh, a soft elastic, whilst it will allow the fish to leave the peg in a much more controlled and dignified manner, um, what it won't do is stop that run. And if, if a fish is allowed to, to bottom out the elastic quite quickly without too much effort, all that will happen is um, all of that stress and impact will come as soon as that um, elastic bottoms out. And you've only got a short sort of distance where you can actually turn that run and you're much more likely um, to break your line, basically. You're far, you're far better off with a heavier elastic that will, um, will slow that fish down all the way out to the bottoming out point. Um, and that gives you a much higher chance of landing everything that you catch and putting your tackle under less strain. So yeah, um, when fishing shorter in the edge, always go for a strong, um, a strong elastic. Personally, I go for a hollow core as well, just to give you that added security. You got a bit more distance uh, before that elastic bottoms out. It's only when your elastic bottoms out you ever get chance of breaking your hook limps or line. Basically, um, the times to use softer elastics um, are for silverfish and um, for fishing longer. Um, I like to fish slightly softer than what you would do um, fishing in the edge for long pole fishing because it just allows everything to be a bit more smoother. Um, so that's my sort of principles on that. I hope that helps. Um, next question from Simon Twaddle. Um, in a match situation on an open water, where would you start um, your first line when fishing on the deck? 16 meters, 14 meters, bottom of the near shelf. Um, right, so basically, um, whether it's open water or whether it's snake lakes, um, and again, we're talking commercials here rather than natural venues because you fish them and feed them in a completely different way. Um, what I'd always look, be looking to do is to pick an area in my peg um, where I, I know I can get a bite, but it's not going to uh, sort of make the fish back off uh, if I feed in the incorrect way um, or in the wrong way or too much bait. Um, and the thinking behind this is very simple. I want to be able to get a bite uh, without disturbing the fish in the peg and do as much learning as quickly as, as possible about how those fish are going to be feeding on a given day. Because we all know it's different. Um, and that sort of 10, 15 minutes when you've got some fish that are prepared to come close at the start of the match gives me the perfect opportunity to do is learn that little bit of learning of whether they're going to come to noise, whether they're going to back off noise, um, whether they want to be off the bottom, whereabouts are feeding, all, all, all those little clues that you can get and you know that that little window there at the start allows me to do that and although potentially I'm risking um, being a few fish behind after the first initial part of the match uh, basically my thinking is it means I've got the rest of the match where I've got a bit of a head start in terms of knowing what's right or wrong um, in the peg so you know, not all venues you can get a bite short. It could just be that you have to get a quick um, fish on the long pole, etc., or a method feeder. But I always think that first part of the match on a commercial, um, you want to err on the side of caution and do a bit of experimentation in an area that's not going to affect you for the rest of the day. Uh, so that's my thinking behind that. So basically, uh, it looks like you're fishing old huff. I'd start short there. Um, what's your best tips on mugging carp? That comes from Scott Howarth. Um, so 
With, when it comes to mugging carp, there's uh, two sort of like different scenarios that I call mugging, if you like. Um, obviously, the third one's dobbing, which in, it, it's mugging in the winter, basically. But in the summer, uh, you've got sort of two scenarios. You've, you've, you've got carp that are swimming in open water um, and swimming shallow and they're visible to us. Um, and you've also got the scenarios when uh, fish are sunbathing and not moving around and they, they generally congregate in and around features um, to the far bank of snake lakes or to aerators etc uh, and both those sort of like times give you an opportunity to catch some fish um, so we'll start with the open water so when you're catching carp from the open water by mugging, you're um, you're instinctively trying to get them to grab at the bait before they've realised that they don't actually want to eat and you've caught one. Um, lots of different baits are used uh, for mugging carp. Um, as far as I can see, uh, in my opinion, a lot of that boils down to colour. Um, some colours they'll grab instinctively, some they won't. So that's why sometimes maggots work, meat, pellets etc so what I do because I prefer to fish pellets because a pellet will allow you to keep a tight line between your bristle and your hook bait and you've got more chance of seeing that bite and hooking the fish um, is to have some different colors of pellets so I'll basically I'll keep a, a tub of pellets in my bag at all times different sizes different colors and I can experiment on the day and 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 find um, find a color basically where the carp um, or more carp um, pick out because obviously, yeah, uh, some some colours are just going to be better than others on the day. Um, red seems to be a good one. Sometimes white. I've got green. I've got yellow. And like I said, um, that's that's my approach. A heavy hook bait, one that will sink quite quickly. But the important thing is that it's it's giving a colour that the fish will home in on and snatch out of instinct and keeping that tight line to your bristle. Uh, the next scenario is when, yeah, when you've got fish uh, sunbathing and not moving around, um, and then to me the hook bait is a bit more important then because I've got time to inspect it. Um, so uh, things like meat, maggots, corn skins, bread, um, they've all got their place and they all catch fish. And yeah, when if I know I'm, I've got a, uh, a match on a snake lake, for example, I'll make sure I've got a selection of hook baits in the bag uh, for this reason. Again, the rigs are slightly different to normal mug, mugging rigs. You want a, a really short sort of like uh, bristle float, a, a body float and a stem, because you're going to be fishing really shallow. Um, generally speaking, you're catching from a few inches deep down to about a foot. Um, I'll also shorten the line down from a normal mugging rig to probably say a foot and a half, two foot, so you can drop it in the reeds or drop it tight to far banks without getting snagged up. And it's useful to have a couple of back shot on basically. Uh, but yeah, you, you're looking for areas where you can physically see fish or reeds twitching and quite often what I find is you'll find an area where some fish are, you'll be able to drop your bait in, uh, once you've got the right hook bait you'll be able to catch one quite quickly after resting the swim, but if you keep going back and trying to catch too much um, the fish will drift off or drift down in the water column and you'll sort of like not extend that run of fish as much as you would do if you was to catch a fish and then go fish somewhere else or or not even ship across to that area even fishing somewhere and in your in your peg where you're not going to get get a bite is more productive than keep going to the same spot because you're just trying to get that confidence for those fish to come back up and sunbathe in the sun and just keep picking the odd one off um, you can actually get quite a good run of fish by doing that um, there are times when you can get two shoals of fish on the go um, and that works really well so yeah that's my two tips for um, for mugging really for the two different scenarios um, hope that helps um, Nick Owen asks uh, hi Lee long time no speak hope things are good and everybody as well uh, when fishing shallow with casters what style float do you prefer and why um, dibber or short bristle uh, the answer is both really um, when it comes to shallow f1 fishing what what you're always trying to do um, is get a bite with um, the hook bait that's fully settled out between um, the bristle and the hook bait. So it's all in a straight line and that gives you the best opportunity to hook a fish. So when fishing a foot or less, um, you want a nice short float and that's when a dibber comes into, um, into play. Um, in that depth, I don't see the point of fishing um, a bristle float. It only makes the float more obtrusive because it's longer 
and um, by the time the hook bait's settled out, you've not got time to read that depth down. Because uh, once you get slightly deeper, which we'll move on to and why I use a bristle, uh, you've actually got time to, to, to hold a tight line and, and read your float bristle. When you're getting indications, if it's not fully settled out, you know that they're, they're higher in the water column. So it gives you a clue straight away to shallow up really quickly. Um, you're not trying to catch these F1s on the drop. It's just not going to happen. Um, you need everything nice and tight between your hook, um, your float and your pole tip to give you that minimum reaction time to, to hook a fish basically. So yeah, um, when you're a foot deep with bristle, um, that's perfect. It settles out straight away and you know they're in that foot zone. Uh, from a foot to two foot, I'll use a little tiny diamond uh, shaped float with a 1.2 bristle, short bristle and a carbon stem. Um, and yeah, again, for that reason, I just want to be able to read whereabouts they are in the water column and shallow up as quickly as I can uh, to make the most of what depth the fish are feeding at that given time. Um, and then once you get past two foot, that shorter float is not quite stable enough. Um, so I go to a more traditional um, slim pattern, similar to a Chianti. Again, for 1.2 bristle carbon stem, so you can follow that shot down. Um, and again, you're just looking to see what depth the fish are at. The, the secret to catching big weight shallow is literally being the one to fish at the right depth of what they're feeding the quickest. Cause it, it, it changes all, all through the day, so you're constantly picking up rigs and reading your peg. Um, I hope that explains why. Um, yep. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, Dusty Fog asked, uh, who cut your hair? No barbers in Hes will open. Uh, yep, yeah, it's true. Uh, I did it myself, um, as you can probably tell. Uh, yeah. Do, 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 uh, your thoughts on hook, hook lengths, uh, pellet waggler, please. That's from Andrew Sprouls. I've actually just done a load. Um, so yeah, uh, when it comes to pellet waggler fishing, uh, so you fish, I fish quite light lines for pellet waggler fishing. Uh, so I generally fish a fixed float to allow um, that length of line where the float is to be doubled up and um, a lot more robust just because the last thing you want to be doing is is um, even, even the float adapters will weaken the line and uh, you, you run the risk of snapping your main line basically. So yeah, where the float is, it's fixed, it's uh, it's doubled up line um, and it's a lot stronger. So that means I've got a fish, uh, fixed hook lengths. Um, I don't put any shot down the line um, unless I'm fishing with an insert waggler, like proper traditional waggler, just because you're not going to be able to register those shots um, on a on a pellet waggler in any way, sh shape or form. But yeah, if you've got an insert waggler, it's definitely worth putting some number 10s uh, and that, they'll go on the hook length. But basically, um, I'll tie up um, seven foot hook lengths. Um, I've got three or four different types that I use and I've, I've swapped over to the, uh, the Q-curve hooks now, which um, I've tied in 12s, 14s and 16s uh, and they're coupled with 018, 016 and 014. Um, that just obviously just gives me a, a, a sort of like different line diameter um, and hook size combination. But yeah, I find the, the you know, the, the offset hook does actually seem to hook more fish. Um, and obviously by having them at seven foot lengths, I can quickly shorten them down on the bank to um, whatever depth that I'm fishing at basically. <coughs> so yeah, that's my thoughts on them. I, I just find by having three or four set patterns or three or four set sizes and rig line combinations set to a long length, that gives me enough adaptability to, uh, to change um, my hook length to what I need to do to catch on the day. Um, so we've got Darren Edgill, or Edgill, sorry, uh, favorite method. Um, that's pole fishing. Um, I am a pole angler, I won't hide it, but I do love rod and line fishing, but if I had to pick one, um, I'm a pole angler. Um, and Logan Ferguson, favorite MIDI product. Um, I'd back that up again with the MIDI XZ65 3. It's a pole that I was able to be involved with a little bit more than uh, the previous ones in terms of the development and I think we've done a fantastic job of it basically. Um, it's my favourite MIDI product and I love getting it out of the bag. Um, is there any more questions? 
can you do some fishing videos? Uh, I already answered this one on online actually. Um, I'd love to, but we can't get out at the minute, but rest assured there's videos uh, planned uh, for when we get off lockdown. Um, so yeah, um, I suppose the last one I'll go through, Jordan Cameron, run me through your setups um, when you was at Bradshaw's. Um, I presume this means when I was uh, fishing Bradshaw's regularly because uh, I don't get to go up there as much anymore. Um, but yeah, I had uh, I'd two years at Bradshaw's fish, Bradshaw Fisheries when I was chasing the matchman of the year. Um, brilliant fishery, um, enjoyed going there week in, week out. Um, it was quite a new venue when I was going um, and I had two good seasons there really. Um, and most of my success was just brought down to fishing short, um, down the middle. Uh, there wasn't much edge fishing, there, there wasn't a huge amount of benefit to fishing across, um, although it was worth a few fish at the start of the match. Uh, but basically, um, the fish were new, um, and I think the fish behaved in a bit of a different way to what you'd expect um, other new venues, um, because I think it had a heron problem to begin with, um, and I found that a lot of the fish uh, were sat in deep water down the track, um, out of that distance of where a heron could get them, basically. Um, and I found that for the for the time that I, I was there, that um, even when you you wouldn't expect them to be in the deep water down the middle, they were there. Uh, so especially for the first year, where it wasn't really uh, shallow fishing, didn't really come into uh, into play at all. Um, I base my approach basically around maggots um, and fishing for everything that swims because it was a brilliant mixed fishery. You got eyed, barbel, tench, um, F1, small carp, roach, skimmers. You're catching everything out of there, and the, the weights weren't massive. So um, yeah, my, my approach was based around feeding and fishing maggots with light rigs. Uh, when I say light, um, not strictly true. They were they were positively shotted, um, quite heavy floats, but with very delicate bristles. Um, I just found with the, the fish being of a gen generally quite a small stamp and uh, being new, um, new fish, they you got very delicate bites, um, and I didn't put that down to the fish being shy. They were literally um, picking up your hook bait and carrying on feeding, and unless you had like a super fine bristle. Um, your bites didn't register as quick as they could do basically so I was fishing one mil bristles um, and yeah so positive shot in positive rigs but with uh, delicate sort of like uh, registration if you like and that was just to make sure that I was hooking fish quicker because I was seeing the bites quicker uh, it was brilliant mixed fishing soft elastics and just all about efficiency um, in the second year that I was sort of like going regularly, it changed a little bit. Uh, the fish come shallow, but again, it was maggot fishing. I used to catch a few fish on pellets across to begin with, but within 10, 15 minutes, I was always on the maggots, either on the deck or up in the water. Um, and in the autumn time, I had a brilliant run of um, fishing little tiny bits of paste. Um, I think in, in, in the autumn, paste fishing can come into its own when F1 fishing, um, especially um, just because um, it's such a big heavy visible hook bait they pick it out quite quickly and um, they can't physically get away with feeding on it without being or registering a bite basically um, so yeah in, in the latter part of the year when you know you'll know the time of year really because you'll put some bait in and you'll see some fizzing but not really get any proper indications on pellets or maggots etc so yeah um, I, had a, I had a brilliant run for a while then and um, through the winter time it was it was all maggot fishing basically um, brilliant venue really enjoyed it um, should get back up there a, a bit really but yeah we'll see what happens when we got out of lockdown um, okay well i hope this uh, is past the time for many of you and i look forward to seeing you on the bank soon